Hello, my name is John Brooks. Welcome to the channel. Today we are going to be looking at how we can design the perfect daily and weekly routine. A lot of people watching this might have a lot of productivity tips, tricks, hacks, methods, but the deeper philosophical question is, what are you using them for? You might think that you wanna be more productive, but why? If you aren't clear on what you're optimizing your productivity for, why you're actually trying to get more done in less time, then how can you gauge your effectiveness? How do you even know that you're being productive at the right things? It's one thing to not be productive, but it's a different kind of problem to be super productive at entirely the wrong thing. And that's something that we want to avoid. Harvard positive psychologist and best-selling author Tal Ben-Shahar believes that happiness is the balancing act of meaning and pleasure. You can be as productive as you like, but if you're not optimizing for meaning and you're not optimizing for pleasure, then you are going to be miserable which ultimately will lead to burnout, despair, and you'll be less productive in the long run. So yes, the how to design the perfect daily routine method that I'm gonna share with you, we will be optimizing for happiness, very elusive thing, but realize that happier people are more productive too. People think that by being productive, you become happier, and that's true to some extent because it engages the dopamine seeking circuit in the brain, but also when you're happier and you enjoy what you're doing, guess what? You can focus for longer, you like your life more, and you're more productive in the long run. At this point, you might be thinking, okay, cool, well, I'll just go off and optimize my life for meaning and pleasure. But I would stop you for a second and ask you, do you know what you find meaningful? Let's take work, for example. A lot of people think that you grind through this tedious thing called work so that you can experience meaning and flow on the other side when you get home. But actually, that might not be the case. In a study entitled Optimal Experience in Work and Leisure, psychologists followed 78 adults around and looked at where they experienced most flow and meaning, and they found that actually they experienced more flow and meaning in work. In the study, they write, leisure is not as uniformly enjoyable as it is generally assumed to be. Common sense assumptions notwithstanding, the most positive experiences in people's lives seem to come more frequently from work than from leisure settings. This mismatch between people's assumptions about work and reality is now called the work paradox. So with all that said, it's very important that we figure out what is meaningful in our lives. And the way that we do that is by following a simple procedure that I've created based on Tal Ben-Shahar's work and my own tinkering. Step one requires us to find our productivity baseline. And we do this simply by tracking everything for one week. If you were to go and speak to a qualified nutritionist, before they put you on a diet, what they would probably do, if they're good, is they would have you track your regular dietary intake so that they can find your caloric baseline. Then, based on your caloric baseline and the way that your weight fluctuates, they'll be able to create a perfect plan for you. We need to do this with the way that we spend our time. We need to find out how we currently spend our time and the habits that we have that might not be serving us in the best way. So for the next week, I'd encourage you to track transport, time you watch TV, time you spend in work, time you spend doing anything. Of course, what you label specific activities as is somewhat flexible. For example, you might go for a walk and then on that walk, listen to a podcast. You can decide if you wanna call that a walk or a podcast, that's up to you. But the idea is that we just try to be as accurate as we can for the next week, tracking every activity that we do. There are a few ways that you can track your time. One of them could be using a calendar and just blocking out everything that happens and then retrospectively going back and filling it in with what you were doing. You can set a timer to go off every hour and then you can just make a note of what you were doing with pen and paper or on your phone. You can use screen time on your phone to see what exactly you were doing, whether you were working or surfing the web. I like to use a time logger too. This is also the same time tracking iPhone app that Nathaniel Drew used in his YouTube video where he spent a week tracking everything. To explain my methods in this video, I will be using Nathaniel Drew's data. The downside of using this data is that he already kind of has his life together. He has meaningful work and a YouTube channel. So he's already interested in productivity. And 
halfway through his week, he started trying to change his habits to improve them. So that's the downside. But on the upside, he did a really good job of tracking his week and he's very comfortable sharing what he did publicly. So for our purposes here, it will be awesome to use. So here you can see a weekly breakdown of Nathaniel Drew's week. We have sleep, editing, filming and prep, time on the phone, eating, time in kitchen. We have exercise, chores, journaling, etc. Here's the weekly breakdown that Nathaniel created with the app A Time Logger 2. When you've recorded all of your daily activities and you're pretty happy with the accuracy of them, the next phase is to add them all up and to create a weekly view. In this weekly view, we wanna have total weekly hours and then we can divide those total weekly hours by seven to give us an overview of what's the average amount of time we spend on this activity per day. That can be very useful. I'm using Notion. It's just a great note-taking app. You can do this with any kind of software that you like. One of the reasons I like Notion is because you have these sorting capabilities, so you can sort the tasks, the activities that you did in, in descending order based on how much time you spent doing them. That can be very useful as we go through the process. And now that we've found our productivity baseline, we have the data that we need, the raw data that we need to work with, now it's time to start adding the meaning map. This is where we start to flesh out what is actually meaningful in our lives. And we categorize this into four areas. We have four basic options here when we categorize our activities based on meaning. We have very meaningful, which is plus plus, meaningful, which is plus, low meaning, which is minus, and meaningless, which is double minus. You can label them what you like, but those four categories I think work really well. If you're struggling determining what's meaningful or not, don't worry too much about it. Just give it your best guess. This is a process that you can get better at the more you do it. But a good question to ask is, if you were on your deathbed looking back at your life, would you regret that activity? Would you consider it to be a waste of time during that week? And if the answer is yes, it's probably not that meaningful. So looking at Nathaniel Drew's weekly time tracking, I will be adding what I think would be meaningful based on my experience. I don't know what Nathaniel Drew himself would consider to be meaningful or not, but let's just take sleep, for example. I consider sleep to be very meaningful. Editing, um, he spends a lot of time editing. I know that editing can be outsourced. So I think that yes, editing is meaningful, but it might not be meaningful to spend 23 hours a week on editing. So I might just put meaningful there. Filming and prep, I think, uh, that would be Nathaniel Drew's calling as a YouTuber, so I'll say very meaningful. Chores, low meaning. Planning, organizing, cleaning, low meaning. Exercise, very meaningful. Transportation, meaningless. Taking a walk, very meaningful. Meditation, very meaningful. Waiting for prints, meaningless. And you can fill it in and you get the picture. When you've fleshed out the meaning for different activities, you'll immediately be struck by some of the incongruencies in how you spend your time. You might, for example, in our example week here, find meditation to be very meaningful in your life, but then you look on average and the time you spend meditating is 0.07 hours a week. That's a red flag right there. You're not doing something that you consider to be meaningful. And then also, if you look at things like chores and planning and organizing, you know, 8.4 hours a week on chores or 7.7 .7 hours a week on planning and cleaning, and that's low meaning, right? So you might wanna ask yourself, do I need to spend that much time doing this? Can I take some of that time away and spend it doing meditation or journaling or this other type of activity that I find meaningful? Just this exercise alone will be life-changing, right? Because you'll see clearly what you need to change and what you should do less of and what you should do more of. But there are more steps to this process, so let's keep going. The third step to this process is adding the framework of the four magical quadrants. So if you look at your week, your life, there are basically four areas that you're working with. You have essential needs, you have highly meaningful activities, you have pleasure and reward, and then you have happiness boosters. So your essential needs are the glue that holds your routine together. Different people will have different kinds of essential needs. Um, for some people that might be picking up their child from school. Obviously things like sleeping factor in, but how much sleep you need depends on how active you are 
And then there are things like work. Sometimes your essential needs are work related, but if you're self-employed, then it's a bit more ambiguous what's essential and what's not. If you can set your own work hours, um, if you're a student, also ambiguous, like how much studying is essential or not. But the idea is things like sleeping, shower, biological things, eating, all of these types of needs that we do every day and we don't really have a choice, that will go in the essential needs column. So the next quadrant would be high meaning. With high meaning, we already have some understanding because we've already added the meaning map to our weekly overview. But when you add the quadrants, things don't have to match up perfectly. For example, if you need to exercise and it's non-negotiable, and you do exercise every day, because if you don't, you might suffer from depression, then you can put exercise in essential needs. And that's fine. Um, it's up to you, but yeah, look through the list again and make sure to flag what is essential and what is meaningful in your life, but non-essential. The third quadrant, and this is super important, is reward and pleasure. Absolutely vital. There is nothing intrinsically wrong with playing video games or surfing the web. It's not unproductive to watch Netflix. It depends on how you do it. As always, context is king. If you reward yourself by watching six hours of Netflix, but you don't do anything, you don't do any work or anything productive, then all you're doing is rewarding yourself for bad behavior. Usually when we give ourselves a reward, there should be some preceding heroic behavior. That's why things like pornography addiction is so ruinous to people because they're triggering the super stimuli, this intense reward circuit for behaviors like being alone and clicking stuff. And the same applies to Netflix and video games. That should come as a reward after you do productive work. So that needs to be factored in though, celebrating your wins and rewarding yourself when you do stuff well. The cool thing about rewarding yourself for doing work as well is that you actually enjoy it way more, right? So imagine working really hard for a month and then taking a two day vacation somewhere. How much do you enjoy those two days? Whereas people who are unemployed and don't really do anything meaningful, maybe they don't have children, they just kind of don't do anything all day, then they're not particularly happy because they're on constant vacation, right? So they haven't earned it. And what's happened is they've adapted through hedonic adaptation to become kind of numb to the pleasure of being lazy or not doing certain things. Hedonic adaptation is an interesting thing. The idea is that no matter what we experience in life, we'll always come back to a rough baseline. So if we win the lottery, studies show, it takes about a year for our happiness levels to come back down to around the place that they were before we won the lottery. And on the other side, if we lose our legs, it takes about a year for us to become as happy as we were before we lost our legs. This is actually great because it helps us become stable. It helps us remain resilient in the face of the chaos that inevitably comes in human life. But this adaptation also tricks us because we think that if we keep buying new stuff or experiencing more pleasure, we will become happier, but we just adapt. Okay, so that's where the meaning comes in. Meaning and pleasure. Pleasure alone is not enough. I personally like to work with ratios. So you might have a ratio of three to one. So three hours of productivity equals one hour of reward, something like that. And that can be bundled like six hours of work equals two hours of reward or something like that. You can play around with it, but you will actually become way more productive if you have rewards for, for doing work. The fourth one, and again, this is a huge one, people don't talk about it, happiness boosters. The, these are not things that you do every day. These are not things that you structure into your day every single day and it becomes a habit. No, these are things that you kind of like pepper into your month or your week. So a happiness booster would be going out, right? Going out and having fun once a week or having a movie night or meeting up with your friend for a coffee. These are just things that when you do, it just kind of like perks you up, gives you this injection of happiness. It's basically like a reward, but on steroids. So happiness boosters for Nathaniel Drew's weekly breakdown. I've put them as taking a walk and speaking with people. What's interesting here is that if you look at taking a walk, he spent half of an hour in the whole week doing something that I consider to be a happiness booster and speaking with people just over half an hour a day or four and a half hours per week. 
So those things would be flagging up on my radar as I must have taking a walk in there. Uh, I'd find ways to make taking a walk even more pleasurable, make it even more of a happiness booster. And also speaking with people, adding, you know, because we can speak to people in a way this is like a quick FaceTime here or there, which is fine. But then we can also do like social events. And typically happiness boosters will be things that involve other people, um, things that are memorable and make you feel present and alive. So now we're on step four, and this is analyze and modify. And this is where we take a look at our data. We look at everything from the meaning to the quadrant, and we decide quite simply, do we want to increase decrease, maintain, or do we want to implement the power of productive downtime or POPD? This is a concept I learned from Ali Abdal. I watched his Skillshare Productivity Masterclass. Very good, super good. The idea is that throughout the day, we're often doing things that we could also be more productive at the same time while doing. So for example, if you spend a lot of time on the train, well, you could do some work on the train or you could listen to an audio book on the train. So that you go through the list and you just decide, oh, do I want to increase that? Do I want to decrease that? Do I want to just maintain that because that's pretty solid as it is? Or can I tweak this so that I can make it more productive, more meaningful, more pleasurable? So here, if we look at exercise, I'm seeing that we have 7.1 hours per week. It's a very meaningful activity. It's an essential need, but is one hour a day optimal? right? That's something for you to figure out. Um, I would argue that you could do four hours, right? Like four hours over seven days. So like train four times a week. And then those other three hours, you can then spread out into things like journaling and meditation. So you can kind of like steal from one area and give to the, to another. So here for the power of productive downtime, I've got time spent in bathroom, waiting around for prints, chores, planning and organizing, and time spent in kitchen. So these are things where you can potentially read a book while you're doing it or listening to an audiobook or a podcast or music. Maybe you can FaceTime a friend or just have like a, a call with a family member while you're sitting and eating if you're on your own, right? There are all these different things that you can kind of do to, to make that activity more meaningful and more productive. And that is the power of productive downtime. Or in this case, it's more like uh, what you would call temptation bundling. So you link something that you have to do with something that you would like to do more. So now the fifth and final stage, block out the week in the calendar. So I use Google Calendar for this. So here in Google Calendar, what I've done is I've color coded the activities of the week based on the four quadrants. So you have green for biological or essential needs. You have pink for high meaning activities. You have red for reward or pleasure. I've left a lot of that off because that will be customized to whatever you want to do. And sometimes that can be done spontaneously as well. And then I have yellow, making sure to have yellow on there for, of course, the happiness boosters. And you want to be seeing that every week. So I've got here, go out socializing, walk audiobook, walk audiobook. I've also got a fair bit of white on the calendar still. I think that's important to, to kind of be flexible. Um, so if you look at the average day in uh, Nathaniel Drew's modified life, according to me, it would be wake up and meditate 30 minutes every day, right? So that's, that's the high meaning activity done. Uh, Nathaniel wasn't doing that much writing. So I've got writing for an hour. So every day you start off with three of the most meaningful activities, filming, writing, meditation. Then you've got exercise as a break, eating after exercise, which is kind of like an essential need slash reward for the exercise. And then we go back to editing, phone time as a reward for the end of the day. You can do whatever you like on your phone for an hour. So if you look here on Saturday, you'll see that there are no work tasks you can add them in if you want, but I think it's good just to have that day free to be flexible. Friday night, we've got go out socializing for a few hours and that could literally just be go over a friend's house or something, but it's in there. It's in there. You're making time and you're showing yourself that you prioritize. There are also two two hour walks with audiobook listening in there. So it's four hours of reading a book in there while walking. So it's like a, a perfect way to spend the week. But remember, 
so many of us have created these kinds of perfect weeks, these ideal timetables or calendars, and we've been all excited about it and then we've failed. And the reason why is because the truth is there is no such thing as the perfect weekly routine. Life is messy, stuff comes up, tasks get assigned to us, unexpected events happen, children become ill, we have to go to hospitals, so much happens that is unexpected, right? So we need to use this ideal daily routine and this meaning map that we've created as a guide, as a blueprint, as something to look back on and compare the way that we're living in the chaos and the storm of life to this ideal perfect thing which we aspire toward. Your calendar shouldn't be a tyrannical, oppressive force, a dictator telling you, you must do this every single day or you suck. That's actually bad. What you wanna do is create a calendar that you want to do. So you look at your calendar every day and you're like, this looks good. I have happiness boosters or reward and pleasure. I also have things that I find really meaningful. And then I'm actually moving my life forward with these essential needs. Right, so it's like this balanced effect. If you don't have those quadrants in a balanced way throughout the week, say you just strip out all happiness boosters, you're not gonna be able to stick to that calendar. If you strip out all reward, what's gonna happen? You're going to binge on reward. You're going to binge on reward and waste days at a time, right? It's like the rebelling effect. As always, moderation, balance, working with yourself. As Francis Bacon said, nature to be commanded must be obeyed. We have to recognize our impulses, our motivations, our desires, our wants, our needs, and we need to work with them and play the game to get the most from ourselves. So use this as a way to check in once every week, once every two weeks, and compare where you're at and modify it if you need. And also look at the meaning map itself. There's a lot of amazing data here. And when you've done this properly once, you don't necessarily need to go that deep with it every time. You can just scan through the last week and go, hmm, let me just estimate the quadrants of the last week. Let me just estimate the meaningful activities that I've been doing and what do I need to change? What in my perfect week needs to be different? So it's a highly useful exercise to do this. It takes a week and a couple of hours to do. A lot of these kinds of productivity systems promise to change your life, promise to make things different forever. And to be honest, I think that's kind of an overused promise. But I actually think that this does live up to the hype. If you do it, if you put in the work and you invest in yourself for the next week in a bit, you'll see incredible changes in your life simply by adding these quadrants and detecting what's meaningful in your life. If you like this video and you wanna see more videos like this, then please like, subscribe, share with a friend, help me grow my YouTube channel. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next video on the channel. Take care.